to the book of Mark, all right? Mark chapter 6 is where we find ourselves this morning. Mark chapter 6. Um, if you are visiting with us this morning, and you, um, or if you've been just for a couple weeks and you don't have one of these, right on that back table, it's okay if you get up while I'm preaching, that's fine. Right on that back table there, there's these Mark journals, scripture journals. Um, they're really cool. They're yours for free if you want one. Um, on one page is the text of scripture, and on the other page is just lines like a journal, and you can kind of take notes as we go. So feel free to grab one of those, grab two of those. Um, those are free for you uh, this morning. So I alluded um, a few weeks ago, I was preaching uh, out of Mark, and we were talking about the, um, the man who was possessed by thousands of demons. And I alluded uh, in that message to the fact that before, um, before submitting my life completely to Jesus about the age of 20, uh, going into 21, uh, I, was, I was a really, really different person. And I was a, not a great person. I was not making great decisions. I was not living in a way that probably my parents would have been proud of. Um, but that's who I was, and then I, I really encountered Jesus in a real way, and then I became a completely different person, like, like drastic, radical, night and day change. I ran into a friend from high school this past week, and um, this is someone that I, we kind of keep up on social media a little bit. She was a really, really good friend in high school, and we were talking, and she said, yeah, because they, they go to church, they're believers, her families are Christians, and they go to a church um, in, the, in the area as well. We were talking about, hey, how's your church going? I know you're, you know, you planted last year. Um, how are things going? We're talking. And she says, yeah. Um, I went and visited another one of our high school friends a few weeks ago. And uh, we were, she was like, yeah, I ran into Adam the other day. And this other friend's parents said, oh, you know, how's, how's Adam doing? What's he up to? And she said, oh, he's pastoring a, a church. And they were like, nope, no way. I ha literally, they said, I have to see it with my own eyes to believe it. All right, that's what they told her. And um, there's a point to that, okay? So the reason they responded that way is because they knew me back then, right? And, and what tends to happen when you know someone years ago, but then you don't see them for many years, you just remember them as the person that you knew, all right? They don't have any context to who I've become by the grace of God. All they know is me in high school. That's all, that's all they know. So no matter what, they're going to think of me as the Adam of old. In this morning's passage, we, say, we see a really tragic story of unbelief in which the people that knew Jesus best for 30 years of his life were confronted with his power, but they could not get past him being the humble carpenter from nowhere Nazareth, which was a town of no significance. And they just could not get past the Jesus that they knew to the Jesus who who they now saw to be. Now, he hadn't changed. He just had not expressed his power in the way that he had been doing now that his ministry had begun. Let's look at Mark 6, 1 through 6, and let's see how this all plays out. And this is something for us, I think, that we'll, we'll get into the application, but it's something that we need to really let kind of sink in and, and be confronted with some questions on how we view Jesus, depending on the length of time that we've known him and what that looks like as we think about our passion and our excitement about him. So let's look at Mark 6, verses 1 through 6. It says, he went away from there, Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could, do no mighty, he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Now, um, I've called this morning the dangers of unbelief. The dangers of unbelief. And that's not where we're going to stop completely. We're going to go all the way through verse 13 this morning. Um, but we're going to break it up like we did last week and just go kind of section by section. But this first section, we're just going to title it a very familiar phrase. Um, it's actually called familiarity breeds contempt. And you might have heard that before. Familiarity breeds contempt. Now, it's important to note um, right up front here that this is not the first time that Jesus has been back to Nazareth once his ministry began. 
This is the second time he's come, and actually this is the second and last time that we'll see him in Nazareth doing ministry. During his first visit, if you remember, it's not in Mark, so we didn't preach it, but it's in, I think, found in Matthew and maybe John as well. But during his first visit, he opens the scroll of Isaiah and he reads the first few verses. And in those verses, um, the listeners marveled because it was a prophecy about the coming Messiah, and he claimed in that reading to be that Messiah. People marveled at him reading it, and they said to one another, they said, is this not Joseph's son? So notice the difference, right? His first visit, when they were first faced with this, they're like, wow, this is amazing. Isn't this Joseph's son? And there's a difference in what we just read in Mark 6, and we'll get to that. But after a brief explanation of the Isaiah passage, they run him out to the side of a cliff, and they want to throw him off and kill him. That's how they respond, and he escapes through the crowd. So that's his first visit. And now he's back again, round two, and and they're confronted again with this person. Now, they had probably for sure heard of the miracles that he'd been performing. They had heard about these things. Um, They sit under his teaching, and Scripture says that they were amazed, right? It says that they were astonished. But being amazed at the teachings of Jesus is not enough. It's not enough just to be amazed at his teachings, these people, they were, they were genuinely amazed at Jesus' teachings. They were amazed at his wisdom. They were amazed at the mighty works done by his hands. But this was not enough for them. Something is not adding up, right? Something's not adding up with them. Well, who is this man? This is how we knew him to be. And in that amazement, this astonishment, this, this con- confrontation with this Jesus, they begin to ask these five questions. Right, they begin to ask these five questions, and you kind of see this progression where at first it's like astonishment, amazement, wow, who is that, where does he get this, and then it all of a sudden turns to insult, and it turns to contempt. Let's look how that unfolds. Right, the first three questions seem genuine. Right, where does this man get these things? Where, where does, what is this wisdom that's given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Like they're recognizing these things are true and they're real about Jesus, But they simply couldn't get past the fact that this Jesus was the same one they knew as one of their own. In fact, they had known him as a citizen, right, of their small, now listen, this town was like 150, maybe 200 people. So they they didn't just know Jesus, like they really knew Jesus, and they really knew his family. It's one of those towns where like everyone knows everyone, and everyone knows everyone's business, and you can't do anything without the town finding out, right? Like they knew Jesus, But in those 30 years, they had never seen or heard anything like this from him. 30 years of knowing him. And they're like, you've never, you've never, well, he did teach like this at at a young age, but um, not that we see in scripture beyond that. We've never heard you teach like this. We've never heard the wisdom come from you. We've never seen the miracles or heard of these miracles you're performing. Something is not adding up. And then we see the true nature of where this questioning leads them, right? In the next two questions. The first one they say, they ask is, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? So now all of a sudden things change, right? First visit, isn't this the son of Joseph? And now it's, well, isn't this the son of Mary? Now, this is obviously different. What, why the change? This was meant to be insulting. Because back then, when you talk about somebody, you'd always talk about them by who their father was. Right? Jesus, son of Joseph. James and John, son of, was it Alphaeus or what was their dad's name? I think that's what it was. You, you, you call him by their father's name, right? So the fact that they are calling him by, uh, as Mary's son was very telling, especially in light of the controversy, the controversy and scandal that surrounded her pregnancy, right? I mean, the rumors were flying. Is it really true? I mean, how, you know, there's scandals surrounding that. So they begin to insult. Isn't this Mary's son? They just could not get past the fact that he was one of them. And then, um, even in the face of of the wonder and and the marvel at what Jesus said, what he was able to do, um, that last question, um, you know, are not his brothers here? Aren't his sisters here? Like, he's just one of us. We know his family. We know his siblings. They're, They're still living here. They're still a part of Nazareth. And even with all of the things that Jesus said and did, they they looked at him and they took offense, it says. They took offense at Jesus. Their pride and their contempt, like there's no way you can come from Nazareth and be better and be better than us. There's no way you can go and make something of yourself from this small little town. 
Nobody leaves Nazareth and does good, you know, good things. There's no way. You're just one of us. So they view Jesus as nothing more than a carpenter from Nazareth. And the fact that he would claim to be more in their presence drove them to be offended. Now, Jesus kind of answers them with an, with an understanding of the sentiment. He, kind of, he understands kind of how they would feel that way, be it a tragic sentiment. And here's why it's tragic, right? Because two things we see as a result of their unbelief, two things happen. We see two things happening. One, it says he could do no mighty work there. He could do no mighty work. One of the results of unbelief is a withholding of the saving power of Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean that he was incapable of doing it. It doesn't mean that he was unable to in the sense that he didn't have the power to. What it meant is that he was unwilling to do so. He was unwilling to do so. And, and Jesus addresses this just to, I like, I like proving scripture using scripture, but Jesus addresses this in Matthew 15. And he quotes there the prophet Isaiah. He says, you will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely, their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So the disbelief, the unbelief, leads to Jesus saying, "Listen, their their hearts are hard, their eyes are closed, their ears they can't hear truth." Lest I heal them, so I'm unwilling to heal because they are unwilling to listen. He would not heal them because of their unbelief. So he could do no mighty work because he was unwilling to do so in the face of such unbelief. And then we see the second thing that happens as a result, and this one is the one that really kind of cuts to the heart. It says Jesus marveled at their unbelief. He marveled at their, he looked at them. These people he had known his whole life, right, like friends, extended family, people he probably had so many stories from doing life with. And he looks at them and he says, wow, everything I'm saying, everything I'm showing you, all the stories you've heard and what you've seen and you still won't believe. He is, in a sense, struck with wonder over how hard their hearts had become. He marveled at their unbelief. And we've got to pause here, I think, for just a minute before we get to the next section. We need to ask ourselves the same question that one pastor that I was reading this week posed to his church. Here's what he said, or asked. He asked, have we become so familiar with Jesus, having been raised in church all our lives, that his words no longer convict, that his miracles no longer astonish, and his death on the cross no longer strikes the chord of amazing grace? Now, my prayer, and has been this week, my prayer is that we would never lose that sense of that childlike wonder with who Jesus is. Just that, that excitement and passion that we had when we first met him. And then as we go through life, it, that things tend to become normal and, and we become complacent. And we'll address that more at the end. But, but I think we need to just pause there and be faced with that question. If I've been a believer for a long time, if I've been raised in church, do I still get struck with that same kind of awe and wonder that I used to when I first believed? Then we get to the second section, and these two tie in pretty well. Okay, We get to the second section. This is um, verses 7 through 13. And this is really just a warning of unbelief. This is a warning. A warning that includes some judgment. But let's look at verses 7 through 13 in, in chapter 6, and then let's talk about that as well. So, um, he, Jesus, called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts. But to wear sandals, that's good. Um, not put on two tunics, though. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now, Jesus is just so timely with his discipleship, right? Because what the disciples are with him in Nazareth, so they see this, this rejection, they see this unbelief, and now Jesus is like, all right, time to put this into practice yourselves. You've seen my power, you've seen how I preach, you've seen how I perform miracles, you've seen what rejection looks like, and now it's your turn. 
Now, probably thinking, now, wait a minute, Jesus. Um, we just saw these people that rejected you, and they knew you best. And now you want us to go out into villages and towns where we don't know anybody. And listen, like, that doesn't sound very fun. And, and we're not public speakers. We're not preachers. We're not missionaries. We're not evangelists. We're, we're fishermen, right? We're, I was a you know, tax collector. You know, we had, we had jobs that weren't necessarily highly thought of. And Jesus is like, yep, I want you to go. And I want you to put into practice what I've been teaching you. So he pairs them up two by two. And there's a couple reasons for this. One, because it's just the, the kind of, you know, most obvious one is because it's more uh, safe to travel with a pair, right? You go by yourself back in that time, you get robbed, you get mugged, whatever. Travel with two. But also, Ecclesiastes 4.9 says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. So when you go with somebody else and work together, there's good reward. Also, Jewish law would require two witnesses for accountability, so there's many reasons behind the method of two by two, all right? He sends them out in pairs, and then also we see that he gives them authority over unclean spirits. Matthew gives us a little more context by telling us the purpose was to cast out the demons, to heal every kind of disease, and to heal every kind of sickness. So go with power, cast out demons, heal every kind of disease, and heal every kind of sickness. Now, Another really important side note here that we have to understand, and, and this kind of gets deeper into some theology and some pneumatology, which is the Holy Spirit um, study of the Holy Spirit. But we have, to, uh, we have to recognize that the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on the disciples. Right? We're, not, we're not to Acts 2 yet. That's where the Holy Spirit comes and falls on them and begins to indwell believers. So that has not happened. The power that Jesus gives these men is a temporary power. This is a, a temporary power that they're given. Kind of think of it like a short-term mission trip. I'm going to give you my power for the short term, and I want you to go out, and I want you to cast out demons, and I want you to heal. All the fears they might have felt, all the hesitation of going on mission on behalf of Jesus. Think about this, right? It could all be calmed knowing that we are going out in the same power that Jesus has shown us as we've, as we've been with him these last few months. All the things that he's done, the calming of the sea, the casting out the demons, the healing the leper, the healing the cripple, right? Like re restoring all of the, the, the physical things and, and the mental things and, and, and the spiritual oppression, like all these things that he's done, he's giving us that power. And so any fear, like if that's me, any fear that I might have of going out and being, being a witness and being an evangelist and like sharing my faith, if I know that I go in the power of Jesus, then nothing can stand in my way. And here's a little, like, tidbit for us. You have that power today. So when the Holy Spirit indwells the believer, we are now filled with the same power that these men had to go out and do these things. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to be careful and not tell you that you have the power to go cast out demons. I'm not telling you that you have the power to go and heal the sick. I'm not telling you that you have the power to do those things, okay? But the same power that raised Christ from the dead is the power that lives in you. So when we go out in boldness to proclaim the gospel, that's the power that we go in. So he sends them out. Same power. And he says, I want you to go bring about spiritual, mental, and physical freedom that I've already shown. And then he says, I don't want you to take anything with you. All I want you to take is a staff and the sandals on your feet, and a tunic, of course. I want you to be clothed. But don't worry about money. Don't worry about food. I am going to take care of you. Whatever village or town you enter, I will take care of you. And then he says, but don't wear two tunics. Just wear one tunic. It's kind of a weird little side note. You're like, why would Jesus say not to wear two tunics? Two schools of thought on that. One is that two tunics could symbolize wealth, and so he doesn't want them to look like they, they are coming in a state of wealth. But a better thought, perhaps, would be that travelers would travel with an extra tunic in case they ended up sleeping outside under the stars. They had that extra tunic to protect them from the elements, whether it be it cold or rain or anything like that. And it's just another emphasis that Jesus is saying you're not going to need to be protected from the cold. You're not going to need to be protected from the elements, the natural elements, because I'm going to give you a place to stay. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to give you all that you need. I'm going to provide all of it. Just, just trust. Right? And this is the point. Right? Jesus says to go, 
and just trust that as they go, he is going to be with them, uh, not in person, but he's going, his power will be with them and he's going to take care of them. He's going to provide everything they need. A couple other things before we get to like the big application point of this, but we see some other instructions, right? When you get to a village, if somebody invites you into their home, stay there until you leave. That's kind of a weird verse. If you look at that, like you read that at face value, like uh, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart. Wasn't that what I would do? If I stay in the house, when I depart, I'm leaving the house. Like it doesn't make sense. What he's saying is, whoever comes and offers you a place to stay first, even if it's a very, very humble place to stay, small, maybe not a lot of means, but then maybe someone else comes like, hey, I didn't know you guys were going to be in town. Come stay with me. Right? Maybe it's a bigger house. Maybe it's better provisions. And Jesus is like, no, the first person that comes and shows you favor and offers you a place to stay, you stay there until you leave that village. Don't go on to the next best thing. Don't leave that person and, and offend them in that way. Just stay there. I'm going to take care of you. Then we get to a really, really important part. All right, listen again to verse 11. Verse 11 says, if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Now, the idea of shaking off the dust would have been one that the disciples were familiar with. Um, it comes from a requirement of old in which um, someone who was Jewish, that would, was a traveler, that was a businessman, uh, would go to maybe a Gentile country. They would go somewhere where it was not Israel. And they would enter that country, they would do their business, and upon returning to Israel, it was required of them to, to kick all the dirt off the bottom of their feet so they wouldn't bring the tainted soil into the Holy Land, into the Promised Land. You can't bring any of that in here. So shake off the dust, leave it behind, and enter back into Israel. So it's a, it's a thought of old, right, the contaminated dirt. Don't bring that into Israel. Take it into context, when Jesus is sending them out, we have to look at Matthew's account again. He just adds a little more detail in this story. But we need to look at his account again to get a, a more full picture of what Jesus is saying. Matthew 10, 14 through 15 says... If anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Same, until you get to verse 15. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Whoa. That's a pretty big statement if you remember what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Basically what Jesus is saying is the judgment that comes upon, upon the unbelief of these towns and villages you go to will be worse than what God rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah. And here's this big warning that we see. Here's the warning. There is judgment coming for those who hear the message of the gospel but refuse to believe it. And we don't like to talk about judgment in our churches. We don't like to talk about the wrath of God in our churches. We like to talk about the happy things, right? We like to talk about Jesus saving us to eternity in heaven, which is great and necessary, and yes, we talk about that. But we like to avoid the hard things like the wrath of God. Wait, God is wrathful? Yeah, and he's very jealous. Wait, wait, God shows righteous anger on how he, on how he deals with people who hear the gospel and refuse to believe? Yes, that's the God that we serve. And we don't like to talk about those things. But let's talk about what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. If you remember, Abraham is up on the mountainside looking down at the city and he's pleading with God. He's like, listen, if you find, if you find 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? God's like, yeah, if, if there's 50 righteous in there, I'll spare the city. He's like, what about 30? What about 20? What about 10? Abraham's like, if there are 10 righteous people in the city, will you spare the city from judgment? He's like, yes, if I find 10 righteous people, I will spare the city. And then the next day, he rains down fire and brimstone, sulfur and fire, it says, on the city because there were none righteous in the city. Unleashed it, destroyed every person, everything, nothing was left. Now you go, man, that's harsh, God. Yeah, it is very harsh. And it's hard to talk about, again, in church on a stage on a Sunday morning. But Jesus says to his disciples, if you go to a town, if you go to a village, if you enter a home, and they reject the message that you bring, leave, shake the dust off your feet, which is a symbol of like, I'm leaving you behind, I'm, 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 I'm kind of wiping my hands of you is kind of similar. God's going to deal with them at a future date. 
you move on and you go to the next town. You go to the next village. So there's this warning, and, and I think we have, to, we have to really get into that warning as well, which we'll, we'll kind of unpack in, here in a minute. Um, but it's kind of hard to, to hear that and go, wait a minute, like people that don't believe are going to be faced with that kind of judgment? So let's just, the, the last verse, right? Jesus, they go, and, and what Jesus says is what happens, right? They go, they preach, proclaim the message of repentance, they cast out demons, and they heal the sick, all right? So they go in his power, they, they go in, and they're on mission, and it's successful. So what do we do then with these passages? It's not an easy one like last week where you're like, oh, Jesus heals, you know, the sick, and Jesus heals um, spiritual oppression, and Jesus, you know, is in control of my situation. Yeah, I get it. Well, what do we do with something like this? What do we do with these passages here? There's three kind of takeaways that I want, and, and maybe one of these will resonate, maybe all of them, I'm not sure, but I'm just praying the Holy Spirit will, will move as we talk about what this means for us. But number one, we have, to, we have to get back to that first passage and just talk about longevity, right? Longev longevity of knowing Jesus. So think about your life, okay? Think about your own life. And just kind of go back to, um, if you're a Christian, if you are a believer, um, how long have you been a Christian? Go back to when that started, right? Was it, was it early, like seven, eight years old? Was it teenage years? Was it like young 20s? Was it maybe a bit older, 30s, 40s? Um, when, when did that happen and how long ago was it? And then ask these questions as I ask them, okay? Do you still get excited about Jesus like the first time you really experienced him? So if you can remember back in that moment when you're like, oh my goodness, man, Jesus, I, I see it now, and I understand it now, and, and, and I believe that you did these things for me, and I believe that you died for my sins, and I believe you rose again and gave me eternal life. I, I believe, and, and I see, and, and I get excited about those things when I, when I believe. Are you still awestruck when you think about what he did for you? Like, does it drive you to emotion? When you go back to that moment of understanding that I was dead, like could do nothing for myself, was hopeless and destined for an eternity of separation from God in hell, like, like that's where I was. And then Jesus, the scripture says, it snatched me out of that. And he brought me into light and he gave me free. Like that moment, are you, are you in awe? Are you passionate about that moment? Or... As time has gone by, and as your relationship has grown, and, and as you've been doing this for a long time, has it become like routine? And it's become more about just kind of, I do it because I do it. It's been a long time. I've fallen into complacency. Is Jesus so familiar to you like he was to them that, you know, it's like, man, I kind of know everything I need to know about Jesus, so why continue to pursue him? You know, I've known him long enough. I kind of know about him. And there's a great danger in this mindset, right? There's a great danger in thinking that, well, I've been a Christian for a long time. So I think I'm good, you know. And, and instead of, instead of like, man, if, if you don't feel the passion, if you don't feel the excitement, if you don't, and listen, guys, I might have it from the stage sometimes when I preach it, but I, like, I struggle sometimes during the week to like get into the passion, like to get into the excitement when I'm reading the word. And I'm like, man, I've read this a lot. I want to learn something new. I want to... So just because I have it like right now doesn't mean I'm always this way. I am a lot of the time, but like there's, it, you have to work at, at understanding and being humble and like getting on your knees and begging God, God, give me the passion that I once had. Give me the excitement that I once had. I, I want to feel that, that I want to feel your spirit. I want to feel just, just the, the awe and wonder at who you are. And I want to go back to that moment when I first believed. And so we pray, God, God, instill that passion in me. Reinstill that passion in me. Grant me the excitement that I once felt. In fact, I would submit that our goal should be that as we grow, as we um, grow more in, in our relationship with Christ, that we should become more passionate about it. Because as we're growing and as we're learning and as we're digging into scripture and as we're here and experience things together, um, it's, like, it's like, man, I, I learned something new about God or, or I'm reading, you know, I'm in Romans right now in my quiet time and I'm reading and, I, and I'm pausing on these verses like, man, I've read this and I've heard this, but I never saw that. And I'm like, man, I get so excited about learning something new. And as we grow in our understanding and as, as, we're, as more of scripture is brought to light and, and, and it's like, man, I, I love learning and I, and I love growing deeper in my faith. But we should be getting more passionate because we uncover more about God. 
rather than, man, we're just kind of stuck because I've been a Christian for a long time and I am tired. <laughs> and I'm so tired of the discipline. I'm so tired of doing this every day. Instead of like, man, I love doing this every day. I love getting up and I love getting in the word and I could read this my whole entire life and I still won't even crack the surface of what's in it. And so there's that passion there, okay? So that's, I think I harped enough on that. All right, number two. And this is, this is a really important one as well. Um, they all are. This question from the first section again is what do you believe about Jesus? All right, so I just talked a lot about it, but what do you believe about Jesus? Remember, it's not enough to just be amazed at his teachings. It's not enough to just be blown away by the stories that we read of the miracles he performed. It's not enough to just be enlightened by his wisdom. We have to get past all of that. And we have to get to a point of believing in our heart of hearts that he is the son of God, God in flesh, and that his death on the cross actually satisfied that wrath that we're talking about, that his death satisfied the wrath of God when God looks at us and it's like, man, judgment is coming one day and Jesus is like, not for the ones that believe, I'm taking that upon myself. So we believe that, right? We believe that God went to the cross, he satisfied the wrath of God, turning God's judgment away from us and putting it on his son. Think about that for a minute. The wrath, okay, Fire and brimstone raining down on a whole city, destroying everything. Worse judgment coming for those who don't believe. God takes that judgment and puts it upon his son on the cross. What I deserved. We have to believe that when he went to the cross, that it's true that he took our sins with him. We have to believe that it's true that it was sufficient to cover our sins, past, present, and future. Not just ours, but of the world. We have to believe that when Jesus rose from the grave, that he defeated physical death and gave us access to an eternity with his Father. Then, then is our belief enough. But just hearing the teachings, being amazed at the miracle stories, that's not enough. You've got to believe in your heart of hearts, in your soul, that those things are true about Jesus. And that's what those Nazarites Nazarites, Nazareth, people from Nazareth. That's what they were missing. Now, the third thing, and this is from the second section, okay? The third thing is this, is that context, one, context is very critical here, okay? So we look at these passages sometimes, and we have to be able to differentiate a passage um, between it being what's called descriptive or prescriptive, okay? What I mean by that is descriptive would be just describing how things were, and then we kind of take that application, and, and we try to apply it the best we can. Prescriptive is like it's a prescription, like, Jesus says do it, therefore you do it, right? This is not prescriptive, it's descriptive. However, there are some truths that we have to take into, into account and, and try to apply into our lives, okay? But we got to be careful not to read ourselves too much into it. This was a, this was a, a, a uh, commissioning of the 12 at, for a very specific period of time and a very sp specific moment in history. But there's some ideas here that apply to us as well. Here's, here's one of them, right, is that judgment is coming. Judgment is coming for those who insist on unbelief. Those who have been confronted with the gospel, they've heard the truth of it, they understand it clearly enough, but yet they don't believe it. And the part of this context that we can't miss is that those who face the judgment worse than Sodom and Gomorrah are those who have heard it already, okay? It's not just everybody, but this specifically is those who have heard and reject. So we could take this in two ways, all right? We're going to wrap up here um, in just a minute, but we're going to take this in two different ways this morning, all right? Number one, as believers who are living on mission, here's my encouragement, is, is that we are never, ever to give up on anybody. Don't ever give up on anyone, Okay? How does that apply to this passage when they were told to leave it behind? Don't ever think that anyone is too far gone. Don't ever stop talking about Jesus to those who refuse to believe. How, un however, understand this, that it's up to the Holy Spirit to change someone's heart. Right? No amount of words that you say are going to change someone's heart. The Spirit will use your words. 
He'll use what you say. He'll use your testimony. He'll use your life story as you talk about what Jesus did for you and what he's doing for you. He'll use those things, but ultimately it's up to the Holy Spirit to change someone's heart. And there may come a point, we talk about shaking the dust off your feet, okay? There may come a point where your witnessing becomes more about praying for the person than it does about continuing to just talk, 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 right? Because there's only so much you can say, and eventually if you go too far with that, you can really turn them off to the gospel. And so sometimes you have to, you have to just know the person and, and you still bring it up, you still talk about what Jesus did, but maybe the testimony, the, the, the point of witnessing turns to more praying for that person than it does continually talking to them. Now, there's, there's a school of thought that says, well, well, am I supposed to like just shake the dust off and be done with that person? I don't know that I'm there, like saying that you should just leave someone behind for good. But again, maybe you, you, you become the, the prayer warrior on that person's behalf. And the second thing I would say about this is that we all need to just check our hearts. And we need, we need to do a real deep check on what we believe. Because maybe... Maybe it's been a long time, but Jesus has, has been just breaking down those walls of unbelief. Maybe you sit here this morning and you don't know Jesus. So here, here, here's what I challenge you to do is, is if you feel like he's, like you're almost there, if you feel like, man, I, I've heard it, I kind of get it, but I'm still wrestling with this, this specific point of, of belief about Jesus, just stop resisting him. Just, just stop resisting him. I'm telling you right now that if you submit to the Spirit's leading, drawing you to himself, and if you bend your knees to Jesus, and you say yes to Jesus, and you make him Lord over your life, I promise you, I promise you, like the, like the, the, the most solid promise I can offer, okay, I promise it's going to be the best decision you ever make in your life. No decision will ever be better than submitting to the Spirit's leading and bending your knee to Jesus. So if you are resisting, if you are in a state of unbelief, even though you've been confronted with the gospel, just, just open your heart to him because it'll be the best decision that you've ever made. All right, let's pray and um, sing together. God, thanks for this morning and uh, for these passages that we are able to get into together and, and read and learn and um, just see how even those who knew Jesus best still rejected him as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as powerful as, as God in flesh. And so, God, let us take that as a warning uh, to ourselves as we um, maybe have walked with you for a long time but yet have become complacent and Jesus has kind of just become a normal part of our day but nothing that we are in, in awe about or passionate about or excited about. So, God, just instill that passion and excitement in our hearts this morning if we've been struggling there. And, God, anyone that doesn't believe this morning, that's been wrestling with unbelief, God, I pray that you would use your spirit to finally break down those walls, completely and let them submit to you, make you Lord of their life. God, Jesus died. We know that he died for the people who sit here in unbelief. And so God, I, I pray that you would just cause them to submit to you this morning. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're just going to ask you to remain.